one it used to puzzle him that after dark some one would look in round the edge of the bedroom door and withdraw again too rapidly for him to see the face when the nurse had gone away with the candle this happened good night master tim she said usually shading the light with one hand to protect his eyes dream of me and i'll dream of you she went out slowly the sharp-edged shadow of the door ran across the ceiling like a train there came a whispered colloquy in the corridor outside about himself of course and he was alone he heard her steps going deeper and deeper into the bosom of the old country house they were audible for a moment on the stone flooring of the hall and sometimes the dull thump of the baize door into the servants quarters just reached him too then silence but it was only when the last sound as well as the last sign of her had vanished that the face emerged from its hiding-place and flashed in upon him round the corner as a rule too it came just as he was saying now i'll go to sleep i won't think any longer good-night master tim and happy dreams he loved to say this to himself it brought a sense of companionship as though there were two persons speaking the room was on the top of the old house a big high-ceilinged room and his bed against the wall had an iron railing round it he felt very safe and protected in it the curtains at the other end of the room were drawn he lay watching the firelight dancing on the heavy folds and their pattern showed a spaniel chasing a long-tailed bird towards a bushy tree interested and amused him it was repeated over and over again he counted the number of dogs and the number of birds and the number of trees but could never make them agree there was a plan somewhere in that pattern if only he could discover it the dogs and birds and trees would come out right hundreds and hundreds of times he had played this game for the plan in the pattern made it possible to take sides and the bird and dog were against him they always won however tim usually fell asleep just when the advantage was on his own side the curtains hung steadily enough most of the time but it seemed to him once or twice that they stirred hiding a dog or bird on purpose to prevent his winning for instance he had eleven birds and eleven trees and fixing them in his mind by saying that's eleven birds and eleven trees but only ten dogs his eyes darted back to find the eleventh dog when the curtain moved and threw all his calculations into confusion again the eleventh dog was hidden he did not quite like the movement it gave him questionable feelings rather for the curtain did not move of itself yet usually he was too intent upon counting the dogs to feel positive alarm opposite to him was the fireplace full of red and yellow coals and lying with his head sideways on the pillow he could see directly in between the bars when the coals settled with a soft and powdery crash he turned his eyes from the curtains to the grate trying to discover exactly which bits had fallen so long as the glow was there the sound seemed pleasant enough but sometimes he awoke later in the night the room huge with darkness the fire almost out and the sound was not so pleasant then it startled him the coals did not fall of themselves it seemed that someone poked them cautiously the shadows were very thick before the bars as with the curtains moreover the morning aspect of the extinguished fire the ice-cold cinders that made a clinking sound like tin caused no emotion whatever in his soul and it was usually while he lay waiting for sleep tired both of the curtain and the coal games on the point indeed of saying i'll go to sleep now that the puzzling thing took place he would be staring drowsily at the dying fire perhaps counting the stockings and flannel garments that hung along the high fender rail when suddenly a person looked in with lightning swiftness through the door and vanished again before he could possibly turn his head to see the appearance and disappearance were accomplished with amazing rapidity always it was a head and shoulders that looked in and the movement combined the speed the lightness and the silence of a shadow only it was not a shadow 
a hand held the edge of the door the face shot round saw him and withdrew like lightning it was utterly beyond him to imagine anything more quick and clever it darted he heard no sound it went but it had seen him looked him all over examined him noted what he was doing with that lightning glance it wanted to know if he were awake still or asleep and though it went off it still watched him from a distance it waited somewhere it knew all about him where it waited no one could ever guess it came probably he felt from beyond the house possibly from the roof but most likely from the garden or the sky yet though strange it was not terrible it was a kindly and protective figure he felt and when it happened he never called for help because the occurrence simply took his voice away it comes from the nightmare passage he decided but it's not a nightmare it puzzled him sometimes moreover it came more than once in a single night he was pretty sure not quite positive that it occupied his room as soon as he was properly asleep it took possession sitting perhaps before the dying fire standing upright behind the heavy curtains or even lying down in the empty bed his brother used when he was home from school perhaps it played the curtain game perhaps it poked the coals it knew at any rate where the eleventh dog had lain concealed it certainly came in and out certainly too it did not wish to be seen for more than once on waking suddenly in the midnight blackness tim knew it was standing close beside his bed and bending over him he felt rather than heard its presence it glided quietly away it moved with marvellous softness and yet he was positive it moved he felt the difference so to speak it had been near him now it was gone it came back too just as he was falling into sleep again its midnight coming and going however stood out sharply different from its first shy tentative approach for in the firelight it came alone whereas in the black and silent hours it had with it others and it was then he made up his mind that its swift and quiet movements were due to the fact that it had wings it flew and the others that came with it in the darkness were its little ones he also made up his mind that all were friendly comforting protective and that while positively not a nightmare it yet came somehow along the nightmare passage before it reached him you see it's like this he explained to the nurse the big one comes to visit me alone but it only brings its little ones when i'm quite asleep then the quicker you get to sleep the better isn't it master tim he replied rather i always do only i wonder where they come from he spoke however as though he had an inkling but the nurse was so dull about it that he gave her up and tried his father of course replied this busy but affectionate parent it's either nobody at all or else it's sleep coming to carry you away to the land of dreams he made the statement kindly but somewhat briskly for he was worried just then about the extra taxes on his land and the effort to fix his mind on tim's fanciful world was beyond him at the moment he lifted the boy on to his knee kissed and patted him as though he were a favourite dog and planted him on the rug again with a flying sweep run and ask your mother he added she knows all that kind of thing then come back and tell me all about it another time tim found his mother in an armchair before the fire of another room she was knitting and reading at the same time a wonderful thing the boy could never understand she raised her head as he came in pushed her glasses on to her forehead and held her arms out he told her everything ending up with what his father said you see it's not jackman or thompson or any one like that he exclaimed it's some one real but nice she assured him some one who comes to take care of you and see that you're safe and cosy oh yes i know that but i think your father's right she added quickly it's sleep i'm sure who pops in around the door like that sleep has got wings i've always heard 
then the other thing the little ones he asked are they just sorts of dozes you think mother did not answer for a moment she turned down the page of her book closed it slowly put it on the table beside her more slowly still she put her knitting away arranging the wool and needles with some deliberation perhaps she said drawing the boy closer to her and looking into his big eyes of wonder their dreams tim felt a thrill run through him as she said it he stepped back a foot or so and clapped his hand softly dreams he whispered with enthusiasm and belief of course i never thought of that his mother having proved her sagacity then made a mistake she noted her success but instead of leaving it there she elaborated and explained as tim expressed it she went on about it therefore he did not listen he followed his train of thought alone and presently he interrupted her long sentences with a conclusion of his own then i know where she hides he announced with a touch of awe where she lives i mean and without waiting to be asked he imparted the information it's in the other wing ah said his mother taken by surprise how clever of you tim and thus confirmed it thenceforward this was established in his life that sleep and her attendant dreams hid during the daytime in that unused portion of the great elizabethan mansion called the other wing this other wing was unoccupied its corridors untrodden its windows shuttered and its rooms all closed at various places green baize doors led into it but no one ever opened them for many years this part had been shut up and for the children properly speaking it was out of bounds they never mentioned it as a possible place at any rate in hide-and-seek it was not considered even there was a hint of the inaccessible about the other wing shadows dust and silence had it to themselves but tim having ideas of his own about everything possessed special information about the other wing he believed it was inhabited who occupied the immense series of empty rooms who trod the spacious corridors who passed to and fro behind the shuttered windows he had not known exactly he had called these occupants they and the most important among them was the ruler the ruler of the other wing was a kind of deity powerful far away ever present yet never seen and about this ruler he had a wonderful conception for a little boy he connected her somehow with deep thoughts of his own the deepest of all when he made up adventures to the moon to the stars or to the bottom of the sea adventures that he lived inside himself as it were to reach them he must invariably pass through the chambers of the other wing those corridors and halls the nightmare passage among them lay along the route they were the first stage of the journey once the green baize doors swung to behind him and the long dim passage stretched ahead he was well on his way into the adventure of the moment the nightmare passage once passed he was safe from capture but once the shutters of a window had been flung open he was free of the gigantic world that lay beyond for then light poured in and he could see his way the conception for a child was curious it established a correspondence between the mysterious chambers of the other wing and the occupied but unguessed chambers of his inner being through these chambers through these darkened corridors along a passage sometimes dangerous or at least of questionable repute he must pass to find all adventures that were real the light when he pierced far enough to take the shutters down was discovery tim did not actually think much less say all this he was aware of it however he felt it the other wing was inside himself as well as through the green baize doors his inner map of wonder included both of them but now for the first time in his life he knew who lived there and who the ruler was a shudder had fallen of its own accord light poured in he made a guess and mother had confirmed it 
sleep and her little ones the host of dreams were the daylight occupants they stole out when the darkness fell all adventures in life began and ended by a dream discoverable by first passing through the other wing two and having settled this his one desire now was to travel over the map upon journeys of exploration and discovery the map inside himself he knew already but the map of the other wing he had not seen his mind knew it he had a clear mental picture of rooms and halls and passages but his feet had never trod the silent floors where dust and shadows hid the flock of dreams by day the mighty chambers where sleep ruled he longed to stand in to see the ruler face to face he made up his mind to get into the other wing to accomplish this was difficult but tim was a determined youngster and he meant to try he meant also to succeed he deliberated at night he could not possibly manage it in any case the ruler and her host all left it after dark to fly about the world the wing would be empty and the emptiness would frighten him therefore he must make a daylight visit and it was a daylight visit he decided on he deliberated more there were rules and risks involved it meant going out of bounds the danger of being seen the certainty of being questioned by some idle and inquisitive grown-up where in the world have you been all this time and so forth these things he thought out carefully and though he arrived at no solution he felt satisfied that it would be all right that is he recognized the risks to be prepared was half the battle for nothing then could take him by surprise the notion that he might slip in from the garden was soon abandoned the red bricks showed no openings there was no door from the courtyard also entrance was impractical even on tiptoe he could barely reach the broad window-sills of stone when playing alone or walking with the french governess he examined every outside possibility none offered the shutters supposing he could reach them were thick and solid meanwhile when opportunity offered he stood against the outside walls and listened his ear pressed against the tight red bricks the towers and gables of the wing rose overhead he heard the wind go whispering along the eaves he imagined tiptoe movements and a sound of wings inside sleep and her little ones were busily preparing for their journeys after dark they hid but they did not sleep in this unused wing vaster alone than any other country house he had ever seen sleep taught and trained her flock of feathered dreams it was very wonderful they probably supplied the entire county but more wonderful still was the thought that the ruler herself should take the trouble to come to his particular room and personally watch over him all night long that was amazing and it flashed across his imaginative inquiring mind perhaps they take me with them the moment i'm asleep that's why she comes to see me yet his chief preoccupation was how sleep got out through the green baize door of course by a process of elimination he arrived at a conclusion he too must enter through a green baize door and risk detection of late the lightning visits had ceased the silent darting figure had not peeped in and vanished as it used to do he fell asleep too quickly now almost before jackman reached the hall and long before the fire began to die also the dogs and birds upon the curtains always matched the trees exactly and he won the curtain game quite easily there was never a dog or bird too many the curtain never stirred it had been thus ever since his talk with mother and father and so he came to make a second discovery his parents did not really believe in his figure she kept away on that account they doubted her she hid here was still another incentive to go and find her out he ached for her she was so kind she gave herself so much trouble just for his little self in the big and lonely bedroom yet his parents spoke of her as though she were of no account 
he longed to see her face to face and tell her that he believed in her and loved her for he was positive that she would like to hear it she cared though he had fallen asleep of late too quickly for him to see her flash in at the door he had known nicer dreams than ever in his life before travelling dreams and it was she who sent them more he was sure she took him out with her one evening in the dusk of a march day his opportunity came and only just in time for his brother jack was expected home from school on the morrow and with jack in the other bed no figure would ever care to show itself also it was easter and after easter though tim was not aware of it at the time he was to say good-bye finally to governesses and become a day boarder at a preparatory school for wellington the opportunity offered itself so naturally moreover that tim took it without hesitation it never occurred to him to question much less to refuse it the thing was obviously meant to be for he found himself unexpectedly in front of a green baize door and the green baize door was swinging somebody therefore had just passed through it it had come about in this wise father away in scotland at inglemer the shooting-place was expected back next morning mother had driven over to the church upon some easter business or other and the governess had been allowed her holiday at home in france tim therefore had the run of the house and in the hour between tea and bedtime he made good use of it fully able to defy such second-rate obstacles as nurses and butlers he explored all manner of forbidden places with ardent thoroughness arriving finally in the sacred precincts of his father's study this wonderful room was the very heart and centre of the whole big house he had been birched here long ago here too his father had told him with a grave yet smiling face you've got a new companion tim a little sister you must be very kind to her also it was the place where all the money was kept what he called father's jolly smell was strong in it papers tobacco books flavoured by hunting crops and gunpowder at first he felt awed standing motionless just inside the door but presently recovering equilibrium he moved cautiously on tiptoe towards the gigantic desk where important papers were piled in untidy patches these he did not touch but beside them his quick eye noted the jagged piece of iron shell his father brought home from his crimean campaign and now used as a letter weight it was difficult to lift however he climbed into the comfortable chair and swung round and round it was a swivel chair and he sank down among the cushions in it staring at the strange things on the great desk before him as if fascinated next he turned away and saw the stick rack in the corner this he knew he was allowed to touch he had played with these sticks before there were twenty perhaps all told with curious carved handles brought from every corner of the world many of them cut by his father's own hand in queer and distant places and among them tim fixed his eye upon a cane with an ivory handle a slender polished cane that he had always coveted tremendously it was the kind he meant to use when he was a man it bent it quivered and when he swished it through the air it trembled like a riding whip and made a whistling noise yet it was very strong in spite of its elastic qualities a family treasure it was also an old-fashioned relic it had been his grandfather's walking-stick something of another century clung visibly about it still it had dignity and grace and leisure in its very aspect and it suddenly occurred to him how grandpapa must miss it wouldn't he just love to have it back again how it happened exactly tim did not know but a few minutes later he found himself walking about the deserted halls and passages of the house with the air of an elderly gentleman of a hundred years ago proud as a courtier flourishing the stick like an eighteenth-century dandy in the mall that the cane reached to his shoulder made no difference he held it accordingly swaggering on his way he was off upon an adventure 
he dived down through the byways of the other wing inside himself as though the stick transported him to the days of the old gentleman who had used it in another century it may seem strange to those who dwell in smaller houses but in this rambling elizabethan mansion there were whole sections that even to tim were strange and unfamiliar in his mind the map of the other wing was clearer by far than the geography of the part he travelled daily he came to passages and dim-lit halls long corridors of stone beyond the picture gallery narrow wainscoted connecting channels with four steps down and a little later two steps up deserted chambers with arches guarding them all hung with the soft march twilight and all bewilderingly unrecognized with a sense of the adventure born of naughtiness he went carelessly along farther and farther into the heart of this unfamiliar country swinging the cane one thumb stuck into the armpit of his blue serge suit whistling softly to himself excited yet keenly on the alert and suddenly found himself opposite a door that checked all further advance it was a green baize door and it was swinging he stopped abruptly facing it he stared he gripped his cane more tightly he held his breath the other wing he gasped in a swallowed whisper it was an entrance but an entrance he had never seen before he thought he knew every door by heart but this one was new he stood motionless for several minutes watching it the door had two halves but one half only was swinging each swing shorter than the one before he heard the little puffs of air it made it settled finally the last movements very short and rapid it stopped and the boy's heart after similar rapid strokes stopped also for a moment someone's just gone through he gulped and even as he said it he knew who the someone was the conviction just dropped into him it's grandfather he knows i've got his stick he wants it on the heels of this flashed instantly another amazing certainty he sleeps in there he's having dreams that's what being dead means his first impulse then took the form of i must let father know it'll make him burst for joy but his second was for himself to finish his adventure and it was this naturally enough that gained the day he could tell his father later his first duty was plainly to go through the door into the other wing he must give the stick back to its owner he must hand it back the test of will and character came now tim had imagination and so knew the meaning of fear but there was nothing craven in him he could howl and scream and stamp like any other person of his age when the occasion called for such behaviour but such occasions were due to temper roused by a thwarted will and the histrionics were half pretended to produce a calculated effect there was no one to thwart his will at present he also knew how to be afraid of nothing to be afraid without ostensible cause that is which was merely nerves he could have the shudders with the best of them but when a real thing faced him tim's character emerged to meet it he would clench his hands brace his muscles set his teeth and wish to heaven he was bigger but he would not flinch being imaginative he lived the worst a dozen times before it happened yet in the final crash he stood up like a man he had that highest pluck the courage of a sensitive temperament and at this particular juncture somewhat ticklish for a boy of eight or nine it did not fail him he lifted the cane and pushed the swinging door wide open then he walked through it into the other wing three the green baize door swung to behind him he was even sufficiently master of himself to turn and close it with a steady hand because he did not care to hear the series of muffled thuds its lessening swings would cause but he realized clearly his position knew he was doing a tremendous thing holding the cane between fingers very tightly clenched he advanced bravely along the corridor that stretched before him and all fear left him from that moment replaced it seemed by a mild and exquisite surprise his footsteps made no sound he walked on air 
instead of darkness or the twilight he expected a diffused and gentle light that seemed like the silver on the lawn when a half-moon sails a cloudless sky lay everywhere he knew his way moreover knew exactly where he was and whither he was going the corridor was as familiar to him as the floor of his own bedroom he recognized the shape and length of it it agreed exactly with the map he had constructed long ago though he had never to the best of his knowledge entered it before he knew with intimacy its every detail and thus the surprise he felt was mild and far from disconcerting i'm here again was the kind of thought he had it was how he got here that caused the faint surprise apparently he no longer swaggered however but walked carefully and half on tiptoe holding the ivory handle of the cane with a kind of affectionate respect and as he advanced the light closed softly up behind him obliterating the way by which he had come but this he did not know because he did not look behind him he only looked in front where the corridor stretched its silvery length towards the great chamber where he knew the cane must be surrendered the person who had preceded him down this ancient corridor passing through the green baize door just before he reached it this person his father's father now stood in that great chamber waiting to receive his own tim knew it as surely as he knew he breathed at the far end he even made out the larger patch of silvery light which marked its gaping doorway there was another thing he knew as well that this corridor he moved along between rooms with fast-closed doors was the nightmare corridor often and often he had traversed it each room was occupied this is the nightmare passage he whispered to himself but i know the ruler it doesn't matter none of them can get out or do anything he heard them none the less inside as he passed by he heard them scratching to get out the feeling of security made him reckless he took unnecessary risks he brushed the panels as he passed and the love of keen sensation for its own sake the desire to feel an awful thrill tempted him once so sharply that he raised his stick and poked a fast shut door with it he was not prepared for the result but he gained the sensation and the thrill for the door opened with instant swiftness half an inch a hand emerged caught the stick and tried to draw it in tim sprang back as if he had been struck he pulled at the ivory handle with all his strength but his strength was less than nothing he tried to shout but his voice had gone a terror of the moon came over him for he was unable to loosen his hold of the handle his fingers had become a part of it an appalling weakness turned him helpless he was dragged inch by inch towards the fearful door the end of the stick was already through the narrow crack he could not see the hand that pulled but he knew it was terrific he understood now why the world was strange why horses galloped furiously and why trains whistled as they raced through stations all the comedy and terror of nightmare gripped his heart with pincers made of ice the disproportion was abominable the final collapse rushed over him when without a sign of warning the door slammed silently and between the jam and the wall the cane was crushed as flat as if it were a bulrush so irresistible was the force behind the door that the solid stick just went flat as the stalk of a bulrush he looked at it it was a bulrush he did not laugh the absurdity was so distressingly unnatural the horror of finding a bulrush where he had expected a polished cane this hideous and appalling detail held the nameless horror of the nightmare it betrayed him utterly why had he not always known really that the stick was not a stick but a thin and hollow reed then the cane was safely in his hand unbroken he stood looking at it the nightmare was in full swing 
he heard another door opening behind his back a door he had not touched there was just time to see a hand thrusting and waving dreadfully familiarly at him through the narrow crack just time to realize that this was another nightmare acting in atrocious concert with the first when he saw closely beside him towering to the ceiling the protective kindly figure that visited his bedroom in the turning movement he made to meet the attack he became aware of her and his terror passed it was a nightmare terror merely the infinite horror vanished only the comedy remained he smiled he saw her dimly only she was so vast but he saw her the ruler of the other wing at last and knew that he was safe again he gazed with a tremendous love and wonder trying to see her clearly but the face was hidden far aloft and seemed to melt into the sky beyond the roof he discerned that she was larger than the night only far far softer with wings that folded above him more tenderly even than his mother's arms that there were points of light like stars among the feathers and that she was vast enough to cover millions and millions of people all at once moreover she did not fade or go so far as he could see but spread herself in such a way that he lost sight of her she spread over the entire wing and tim remembered that this was all quite natural really he had often and often been down this corridor before the nightmare corridor was no new experience it had to be faced as usual once knowing what hid inside the rooms he was bound to tempt them out they drew enticed attracted him this was their power it was their special strength that they could suck him helplessly towards them and that he was obliged to go he understood exactly why he was tempted to tap with the cane upon their awful doors but having done so he had accepted the challenge and could now continue his journey quietly and safely the ruler of the other wing had taken him in charge a delicious sense of carelessness came on him there was softness as of water in the solid things about him nothing that could hurt or bruise holding the cane firmly by its ivory handle he went forward along the corridor walking as on air the end was quickly reached he stood upon the threshold of the mighty chamber where he knew the owner of the cane was waiting the long corridor lay behind him in front he saw the spacious dimensions of a lofty hall that gave him the feeling of being in the crystal palace Euston station or st paul's high narrow windows cut deeply into the wall stood in a row upon the other side an enormous open fireplace of burning logs was on his right thick tapestries hung from the ceiling to the floor of stone and in the centre of the chamber was a massive table of dark shining wood great chairs with carved stiff backs set here and there beside it and in the biggest of these throne-like chairs there sat a figure looking at him gravely the figure of an old old man yet there was no surprise in the boy's fast-beating heart there was a thrill of pleasure and excitement only a feeling of satisfaction he had known quite well the figure would be there known also it would look like this exactly he stepped forward on to the floor of stone without a trace of fear or trembling holding the precious cane in two hands now before him as though to present it to its owner he felt proud and pleased he had run risks for this and the figure rose quietly to meet him advancing in a stately manner over the hard stone floor the eyes looked gravely sweetly down at him the aquiline nose stood out tim knew him perfectly the knee breeches of shining satin the gleaming buckles on the shoes the neat dark stockings the lace and ruffles about the neck and wrists the coloured waistcoat opening so widely all the details of the picture over father's mantelpiece where it hung between two crimean bayonets were reproduced in life before his eyes at last only the polished cane with the ivory handle was not there 
tim went three steps nearer to the advancing figure and held out both his hands with the cane laid crosswise on them i've brought it grandfather he said in a faint but clear and steady tone here it is and the other stooped a little put out three fingers half concealed by falling lace and took it by the ivory handle he made a courtly bow to tim he smiled but though there was pleasure it was a grave sad smile he spoke then the voice was slow and very deep there was a delicate softness in it the suave politeness of an older day thank you he said i value it it was given to me by my grandfather i forgot it when i his voice grew indistinct a little yes said tim when i left the old gentleman repeated oh said tim thinking how beautiful and kind the gracious figure was the old man ran his slender fingers carefully along the cane feeling the polished surface with satisfaction he lingered specially over the smoothness of the ivory handle he was evidently very pleased i was not quite myself uh, at the moment he went on gently my memory failed me somewhat he sighed as though an immense relief was in him i forget things too sometimes tim mentioned sympathetically he simply loved his grandfather he hoped for a moment he would be lifted up and kissed i'm awfully glad i brought it he faltered that you've got it again the other turned his kind gray eyes upon him the smile on his face was full of gratitude as he looked down thank you my boy i am truly and deeply indebted to you you courted danger for my sake others have tried before but the nightmare passage um he broke off he tapped the stick firmly on the stone flooring as though to test it bending a trifle he put his weight upon it ah he exclaimed with a short sigh of relief i can now his voice again grew indistinct tim did not catch the words yes he asked again aware for the first time that a touch of awe was in his heart get about again the other continued very low without my cane he added the voice failing with each word the old lips uttered i could not possibly allow myself to be seen it was indeed deplorable unpardonable of me to forget in such a way zounds sir i i his voice sank away suddenly into a sound of wind he straightened up tapping the iron ferrule of his cane on the stones in a series of loud knocks tim felt a strange sensation creep into his legs the queer words frightened him a little the old man took a step towards him he still smiled but there was a new meaning in the smile a sudden earnestness had replaced the courtly leisurely manner the next words seemed to blow down upon the boy from above as though a cold wind brought them from the sky outside yet the words he knew were kindly meant and very sensible it was only the abrupt change that startled him grandfather after all was but a man the distant sound recalled something in him to that outside world from which the cold wind blew my eternal thanks to you he heard while the voice and face and figure seemed to withdraw deeper and deeper into the heart of the mighty chamber i shall not forget your kindness and your courage it is a debt i can fortunately one day repay but now you had best return and with dispatch for your head and arm lie heavily on the table the documents are scattered there is a cushion fallen and my son is in the house farewell you had best leave me quickly see she stands behind you waiting go with her go now the entire scene had vanished even before the final words were uttered tim felt empty space about him a vast shadowy figure bore him through it with its mighty wings he flew he rushed he remembered nothing more until he heard another voice and felt a heavy hand upon his shoulder tim you rascal what are you doing in my study and in the dark like this he looked up into his father's face without a word 
he felt dazed the next minute his father had caught him up and kissed him ragamuffin how did you guess i was coming back to-night he shook him playfully and kissed his tumbling hair and you've been asleep too into the bargain well how's everything at home eh? jack's coming back from school to-morrow you know and four jack came home indeed the following day and when the easter holidays were over the governess stayed abroad and tim went off to adventures of another kind in the preparatory school for wellington life slipped rapidly along with him he grew into a man his mother and his father died jack followed them within a little space tim inherited married settled down into his great possessions and opened up the other wing the dreams of an imaginative boyhood all had faded perhaps he had merely put them away or perhaps he had forgotten them at any rate he never spoke of such things now and when his irish wife mentioned her belief that the old country house possessed a family ghost even declaring that she had met an eighteenth-century figure of a man in the corridors an old old man who bends down upon a stick tim only laughed and said that's as it ought to be and if these awful land taxes force us to sell some day a respectable ghost will increase the market value but one night he woke and heard a tapping on the floor he sat up in bed and listened there was a chilly feeling down his back belief had long since gone out of him he felt uncannily afraid the sound came nearer and nearer there were light footsteps with it the door opened it opened a little wider that is for it already stood ajar and there upon the threshold stood a figure that it seemed he knew he saw the face as with all the vivid sharpness of reality there was a smile upon it but a smile of warning and alarm the arm was raised tim saw the slender hand lace falling down upon the long thin fingers and in them tightly gripped a polished cane shaking the cane twice to and fro in the air the face thrust forward spoke certain words and vanished but the words were inaudible for though the lips distinctly moved no sound apparently came from them and tim sprang out of bed the room was full of darkness he turned the light on the door he saw was shut as usual he had of course been dreaming but he noticed a curious odour in the air he sniffed it once or twice then grasped the truth it was a smell of burning fortunately he awoke just in time he was acclaimed a hero for his promptitude after many days when the damage was repaired and nerves had settled down once more into the calm routine of country life he told the story to his wife the entire story he told the adventure of his imaginative boyhood with it she asked to see the old family cane and it was this request of hers that brought back to memory a detail tim had entirely forgotten all these years he remembered it suddenly again the loss of the cane the hubbub his father kicked up about it the endless futile search for the stick had never been found and tim who was questioned very closely concerning it swore with all his might that he had not the smallest notion where it was which was of course the truth. End of story six.